Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined again today by Professor Diana Schaub of uh, Loyal University, Maryland. Um, we've discussed Frederick Douglass. We've discussed Booker T. Washington. We've discussed Abraham Lincoln's uh, Lyceum speech and Gettysburg Address. And today we're going to discuss the second inaugural. So real, little, our own little course in American, in the highlights of American political thought. And they are really the highlights, aren't they? Uh, they are, and right. uh, second inaugural is the culmination. Okay, good. Well, this is this is putting the pressure on today, but that's that's okay. Uh, Diana has uh, written widely in American uh, American political thought, but excellent book on Montesquieu and focusing on the Persian letters and on liberalism. And so it's a real pleasure to have have you with me again today, Diana. And uh, let's discuss the second inaugural, which is a little longer than the Gettysburg Address, but short enough, I think that we can just go through it textually. And it's there's a ton of riches, I think, in this speech when read and read carefully, so. Yes, so so everyone should get their text out. Right, you, you're if you can get your text. You're not allowed to come to class if you don't have your text with you. We'll go, we'll, we'll read it maybe in, uh, as well, but you should have the text, and certainly when you want to go back to it afterwards and ponder these things more deeply and correct, uh, whatever bad interpretations we offer, there Diana offers, then you can, <laughs> you want to be able to look, to look at the text. I, Do you want to set it in any context at all, or it's sort of self-explanatory, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe just to mention that this is the first second inaugural in 32 years uh, hmm. since since Jackson. So that's that's significant. Uh, at at the same time, because there had been a number of second inaugurals in the first seven presidents, five of them served two terms. There was a kind of tradition and expectation about what a second inaugural uh, looks like, and I think in almost every respect, uh, Lincoln. Uh, goes against those expectations. So this is a very unusual second inaugural. Yeah, the more one looks at it, as I did a couple of times before this conversation, the more striking that is, though it's the most famous second inaugural. It's funny, when you when people talk about the second inaugural, what'd you say? You can just say that and people assume it's Lincoln's. It's the only one that really has a sort of stands as the second inaugural, which is itself, I suppose, revealing of, of something. And so he gives it and it's it's, the war is... Ending, but not over, just to put it in Almost context. over four to five weeks away, so it's pretty clear what the trajectory is. Uh, but there will actually be 25,000 more, uh, you know, dead and wounded in those four to five weeks. But, yeah, it is wrapping up. Uh, the outcome, I think, is clear by this point. Okay, so do you want to read the first? And it's, well, it's four paragraphs, I think, and uh, one of which the third is much the longest and has the famous discussion of the Bible and God and so forth, but let's go through it paragraph yeah. by paragraph. Good. Do, do, do you want to re do the reading or? Uh, well, I'll, okay, I'll do the first paragraph, you do the okay. second, and we can go back and forth. So, uh, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was the first. Then, a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued, seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth at every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. So the only common element here to inaugurals is, I think, the focus on the oath. Uh, and that's true of, uh, you know, every inaugural you can cite. Uh, and it was certainly true of his first inaugural, where he began the speech talking about the oath and virtually ended the speech talking about the oath. But none of the other usual elements are present. He doesn't express gratitude for the reelection, you know, the people returning him to office. Uh, he doesn't give any kind of review of the policy successes from his first administration. Right. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't really mention the incipient victory. Um, and uh, he makes no sketch of future plans. Uh, and of course, the expectation of the audience uh, would have been that Lincoln would lay out the plans for reconstruction. Uh, that's what was on everyone's mind. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do that. So somehow what he does in this speech is a necessary, perhaps prerequisite, uh, 
to laying out the plans for reconstruction, which he never, of course, fully gets a chance to do. But Yeah, I think so. I mean, we do get that very last public address from him where he will say more about the actual concrete plans for reinstituting the, uh, you know, the national authority. Uh, but yeah, in this speech, he is doing something different. And I think it really is a kind of... Um, uh, trying to bring the people to the proper uh, attitude and spirit uh, that will be necessary if Reconstruction is going to have any chance of success. Right. Well, that's what's striking. Um, we'll come back to that, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you point out... So in the... Oh, I don't think I mentioned yeah. your book. So I have the ah. advantage of having read <laughs> Diana already on and it's her forthcoming book. We're speaking in October. I think it's out in November. Uh, out in November. This is, yeah, it's sort of advanced, speeches, advanced but we'll, copy. We'll, but this will be a freestanding conversation, which maybe it'll, maybe it'll be go on, go beyond something you say in the book. I don't know. Um, there is always and, more to discover. There is. It's really there honestly striking. is. So let's just... so. Yeah, I mean, uh, it looks back to the first inaugural, but in a very oblique. I mean, that that does seem to be striking. How much he wants to frame it somehow. There were these four years, and that period is kind of over, and now we're moving to something else, right? Yeah, there is this time compression. Uh, so the first two paragraphs sort of go back and forth between March four. 1865, right, the second appearing to take the oath, and March 4, 1861, the first appearing to take the oath. Um, so he, there's this in, incredible time compression where he sort of goes back and forth between those two dates. Uh, and uh, Lincoln is always doing something interesting with time in his speeches. Uh, in the Gettysburg Address, we saw that he begins, you know, in the past, four score and seven years ago, 1776, moves to the present, now, right? the, the dedication at Gettysburg, and he ends with the future. Uh, the nation shall have a new birth of freedom. Uh, here, in a way, the movement is the reverse of that. He begins in the present and then the very near past, 1861. He has quite a bit to say about 1861. Uh, and then, towards the end of the speech, he goes back into the remote past. We'll, we'll get there, but he actually brings up the date of 1619, uh, the origins of slavery uh, in the United States. And then, at, and then uh, at almost the very end, he goes back even further than that to 3,000 years ago. Uh, so I, I think this speech is a kind of um, archaeology, uh, an attempt to figure out the, the real cause of the war, and it involves this archaeological kind of unearthing endeavor. Uh, but he begins right, uh, with, this, with this second appearing. Uh, I, I think we need to say something just about the oddity of that formulation, um, many commentators have noted the absence of any kind of gloating or glorying uh, in, this, in this speech. And I think the clearest indication of that is the way in which Lincoln suppresses him, himself. He, he just presses himself out of view. And he does that grammatically. Uh, and it, it is sometimes at the cost, actually, of, of proper grammar. Uh, you can see it in the final sentence of the first paragraph. With high hope for the future, I make no prediction. Uh, I mean, that is actually a dangling modifier. No prediction cannot have high hope for the future. He doesn't say, I make no prediction. It's right, he doesn't say that. Right. No everybody's, prediction is ventured. Yeah. Right, everybody's got the text in front of them so they can see there's no I there and there should be an I there. Right. Uh, I mean, this is his second inaugural. It's his oath-taking. Uh, and yet he basically refuses to use the first-person pronoun. It is slipped in only in that little parenthetical about the progress of our arms being I trust reasonably satisfactory. So uh, he, he really, there's, there's this studied uh, avoidance of self-reference. And it's actually very difficult to pull off, uh, given that it is his oath-taking. Right? Even in that first sentence, you might have expected him to say, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, I find that there is less occasion for an extended address. It also leads to the passive voice, which is we all, I'm sure you tell your students, avoid yeah. the passive voice, you know, and it's a very <laughs> passive voice, first paragraph. You know? Lincoln does it all the time uh, to, great, to great effect. Uh, so I think this is already an, an indication that there is something very unique and odd going on in this speech. And his initial focus is actually on the difference in length 
between the first inaugural and the second inaugural. Right. He's saying, I'm going to speak very briefly. He's alerting people to that. Uh, he says in 1861, uh, you know, fuller speech was fitting and proper. Now, this is also, uh, uh, I think, terrific, shows his care. There are only two places in his writings where he uses the phrase fitting and proper. First time is in the Gettysburg Address when he says that the dedication of the cemetery is altogether fitting and proper. Uh, and then here in speaking of the first inaugural, he says that longer speech was fitting and proper. So in, in fact, what I think he has done is he has managed to link the three major presidential addresses together. Uh, so he's linked the first inaugural and the second inaugural by this comment about the, the the length of the speeches. And then he's put in these phrases from the Gettysburg Address, fitting and proper, and then also the use of little that is new could be presented. It's a kind of echo of the world will little note nor long remember, uh, also from Gettysburg. Uh, so he's... Uh, uh, he, he's doing the same thing that he did in Gettysburg, where he's kind of uh, depreciating speech in relation to deed. Uh, and he's saying that what matters is what the soldiers are doing, right? In the Gettysburg Address, it's what the brave men did. Uh, here, it's the progress of our arms. Right? It also seems that, you, I mean, we'll get to this more later. So, I mean, it does seem this has to be read in conjunction ultimately with Gettysburg, because it's somehow a, I don't know if it's a correction, commentary, sub, you know, a. Uh, um, adds yeah. addition to Gettysburg somehow, but very much a different spirit, I would say, kind of almost uh, cutting against might be too strong, but but the very, as you say, the, yeah. the order is different, but also the overall thrust of it is quite different from Gettysburg. Yeah, I mean, Gettysburg, as I understand it, is a war speech. Uh, it's about uh, maintaining war morale uh, and bringing about the, the victory. And this is a peace speech, and he is... Um, actually refusing to celebrate the victory. Yeah, that's good. And Gettysburg begins with four scored seven years ago, so vaguely biblical, and, and goes right to, ends up in the present and the future, new birth of freedom, and kind of a, you know, a, a assertive statement of what can be accomplished. This is sort of the opposite, right? I mean, it, it begins in the present, as used to four years, instead of four score years, and it's four score and seven years ago, but ends up in this deep reflection on the Bible and what God wills yeah. and so forth. Although I, I guess I do see, I mean, I, I attach some significance to that phrase under God from the Gettysburg Address. So I think there is already um, this thought that somehow uh, the nation has to be understood Not as fair. under yeah. divine providence. And in both speeches, they they certainly end with an emphasis on human agency. So while there is this long theological explanation of the meaning of the war uh, in the in the second inaugural, the ending is let us strive on. Yeah. Right, that's an imperative. Let us strive on, and it's actually parallel to the Gettysburg's address. Uh, you know that we hear highly resolve. So both of those speeches uh, involve a kind of call to to human action. That's good. Yeah. But maybe a different yeah. emphasis or a different... Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Anything else in this uh, first paragraph? Um, oh, well, of course, there's always tons that we could do, but we do, we do need to move on. So let's let's. But I would just say this. one other thing you, you make yeah. before the book, so I'm stealing this from you, but he, he says the progress of the arms is reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. <laughs> But who is that all? Presumably the, the, our, our friends in the yeah. South are not encouraged by this. So, but it, it's the beginning of a repeated use of all, which you can talk about more when we get to the next paragraph, I guess. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's maybe just worth saying uh, all is the most uh, frequently used uh, word in the speech. Uh, it occurs 10 times. And uh, it, it, you're right that the, uh, who, who is included within the all shifts as the speech unfolds. So in the first reference to all, it is only the unionists. Right? They're the only ones who could take heart <laughs> from the progress of our arms. So uh, at that point, the all is limited to those in favor of the union. But uh, as we go through the speech, we'll see that the all expands. So that, that's another indication, I think, of what he's, what he's up to here. And I suppose the no prediction, just one of the things that just strikes me now, in regard to the future is venture, it is of a piece with a certain kind of modesty about what we can know, right? Which very much is a theme of the, later in the third paragraph, the yeah. discussion of God has his own purposes and so forth, you know. 
Yeah, it, it might be worth mentioning um, a letter that Lincoln wrote, a very short letter he wrote to Thurlow Weed um, a week or so um, uh, after the second inaugural. Uh, Weed had written to him praising the speech, and he said, you know, thank you for the compliment. Uh, everybody likes a compliment. Uh, and then um, he uh, points out that uh, he thinks the speech was not immediately popular. Uh, people were puzzled by it. You know, why didn't he tell us what his plans for the future he are? He or he Lincoln? Uh, no, he Lincoln says oh, that well. it was not, you know, he says I, uh, the feeling is not immediately popular. Uh, but he says, I think it will wear as well as anything I've ever written. Hmm. So Lincoln believes this is his greatest speech. Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, he says, I, I think everybody ought to kind of humor me in the giving of this account. Uh, because if there's any humiliation involved in it, it falls primarily on myself. So that's interesting that he describes the speech as involving his own humiliation. Uh, and I, I think you see that in the way in which he's humbling himself, in which he's leaving himself out. He's taking no credit. Uh, he's not even making a prediction uh, about about the victory. He refuses to move in that uh in that uh, triumphalist direction. Yeah, the public knows as well as he does what's going to happen, he says. Yeah. It can't quite be true, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe it's a deep level. Yeah. Okay, yeah. second paragraph, why don't Good. you read it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. Okay, so this is about the four year really what happened right in this uh, four years ago and yeah so this is really i think about the outbreak of the war right? he's not yet at the cause of the war that won't come until the third paragraph but this is the description of the outbreak of the war uh and so this is 1861 and march 4th 1861 uh, this is, uh, I think you might say, a kind of surface account, right, on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago. Uh, he's still very much abstracting from himself. Uh, the focus is on the all, right? All were anxious, all dreaded war, all sought to avert war. Uh, but the all has now expanded to include the insurgent agents, all right, those who were in the city on that day, you know, presumably just a handful of, uh, of people uh, who were trying to carry out these uh, negotiations that would give the South what it wanted, uh, would, would uh, allow for secession without war. Um, so, I mean, I, I, again, it's a really remarkable account. He, he says there, are, there were two parties. Um, and they were operating from this place and the city. And so he's really localizing the conflict in Washington, D.C. Uh, again, I think there's a kind of unclarity about who those are who are devoted altogether to saving the Union. As he says, it's while the inaugural address was being delivered from this place. So what is this place? Uh, is it is it actually a description of Lincoln himself? <laughs> you know, the place he occupied as he delivered the address, the East Portico of the Capitol, uh, as he delivered the first inaugural, or does it also include Congress, which at that point, remember, would have been an overwhelmingly Republican Congress? Um, seven states had already seceded from the Union; uh, their representatives were not present. Uh, so it, it might mean the government, right? That's the party that is devoted altogether to saving the Union without war. Uh, and then you have this handful of insurgent agents. Uh, then I think there's a kind of expansion when he moves to both parties. One of them would make war rather than let the nation survive. So that's no longer just the insurgent agents 
right? But that's the party that has sent those insurgent agents uh, to conduct those uh, that attempt at, uh, at at peace negotiations. And at this point, though, Lincoln doesn't make stress this. And these insurgent agents were not like a random few people who would showed up, you know, cause trouble. They were uh, were saw themselves as working for states of the union that had yes, they were already uh, separated yes. and, and announced a confederacy. I mean, Lincoln sort of, uh, you know, uh, doesn't e- stress that e- fact that we're already... Right. Uh, yeah, so he doesn't draw attention to the states or the seceded states. Right? It's these insurgent agents, and then it's this expansion to both parties, right? those who would make war. Um, so I think by the end of the paragraph, you have the two parties. You have the party that's set on the extinction of the nation, and you have the party that's set on the preservation of the nation. Um, and as I see it, four points emerge here. No one wanted war. Right? So there were no belligerents. Uh, there were no warmongers. Okay? Nobody wanted war. Uh, second, the, the conflict was over the Union, uh, whether the Union would be destroyed or saved. Right? He puts those words in italics, saving the Union or destroying it. Uh, third, the war was a consequence of human actions and human choices. Uh, both parties valued something more than they valued avoiding war. They wanted to avoid war, but they valued something else more. Uh, and then fourth, uh, the, you know, the war can't be understood as a mistake or an accident. Uh, the, the war had a logic, and the war came. Right? That's somehow the logic of events based on these uh, human, human choices. So this, this, I think, is an altogether human account right, of the uh, emergence of the war, of the outbreak of the war. Yeah, that's what struck me. The first two paragraphs of the speech that is so famous for its later discussion of <laughs> uh, mysteries of uh, the Almighty and uh, the biblical yeah. quotes and so forth, uh, the first two paragraphs are entirely not only just secular, but kind of narrow, I would say limited. I mean, very much four years ago, and then they're, just yeah. more, you know, and uh, not not totally separate from, from that. And uh, um, Yeah, he's also pressing out of view parties that might have been thought to have played a role in the outbreak of the war, like the abolitionists. Right. right. Here it's just the, 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 the government, those devoted to saving the Union, and... Uh, the insurgent agents, and then those behind the insurgent agents. And you sort of think at the end of this two paragraphs, I would say, if you just read those two and didn't know what was coming next, after and the war came, which is the last sentence of the second paragraph, obviously. Okay, now he's going to say something about the war, presumably. I mean, <laughs> you know, and this is, it was rough, and it was, yeah. uh, we, we so honor the sacrifices, a little of the Gettysburg stuff, and, and you know, yeah. if you wanted to be nice, you could honor those on both sides who thought they were doing the right thing, but there's a very abrupt switch that after and the war came. Yeah, uh, and I, I think then to uh, the inquiry into a deeper causation. Right? Uh, uh, m- maybe one other thing about this second paragraph, and that is the, the impression of equivalence uh, through the use of words like, you know, all dreaded it, and then, you know, uh, both this uh, and that. Uh, it's an effect, I think. The impression of moral equivalence is an effect of the use of these indefinite pronouns. Uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there is a clear moral judgment uh, being delivered of the parties. Uh, there are the republic destroyers and there are the republic savers, uh, those who are devoted to the salvation of the Union. So again, you get echoes of the Lyceum Address, right, where he first introduced uh, this phenomenon of the destruction of the of the Republic and the danger of that. Uh, and you get echoes, uh, of course, also of the, the Gettysburg Address. Uh, so I think there is a clear moral judgment here. But at the same time, he is not placing sole blame on the insurgents. Right? It did take both parties. Uh, acting as they did for the reasons they did uh, to produce the war that neither side wanted. And no, and no mention in the first two paragraphs of 
slavery, slaves, uh, the enslaved, uh, the South. I mean, no proper nouns almost except for the Union, I guess. Is that right? Um, right. So kind of an abstract, you might say, discussion yeah. of what had happened. Um, yeah, doing, doing that same thing that he did in the Gettysburg Address, this tremendous abstraction. Um, you know, those who are in the midst of what is happening will, I think, very quickly understand who he is talking about here. Right. But um, I, I think it, it has to do with the, the avoidance of blame or the downplaying of blame or the shifting of blame. And um, we'll see what that shifts to in the, in the third paragraph. Okay, so should we get to the, the third yes. very yeah, we the need longest to, paragraph? So say a word about that, there. and then we can go through it in sections, perhaps. Okay. Uh, it, it's maybe just worth saying something uh, about the structure here. So we've got these two opening paragraphs. Each of them is five sentences, and then you have this very, very long third paragraph. It's 15 sentences. And uh, I think there are certain places at which he could have broken it into, uh, into more paragraphs. The... Probably the most likely place, the sentence that everyone focuses on, the kind of fulcrum of the address, is uh, really at the halfway point. If you just do a word count in the address, the Almighty has his own purposes. Uh, if you were to split it there, you would have 10 sentences in the first half of the third paragraph and five sentences in the second half of the third paragraph. Um, but I think there's also an argument for splitting it a little bit earlier, and that's with the introduction of religion. Religion is going to become the theme of this third paragraph, and that begins uh, with the sentence, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. So that's the moment at which religion is introduced. Uh, so you could also split the paragraph there. Then you'd have, I think it's uh, seven sentences in the first half of the paragraph and eight in the second half. So if we... Uh, I guess we could maybe, why don't, why don't we read through to that, uh, both read the same Bible. Let's, let's stop there and just do those first. Okay, I'll, uh, I can do that. And, uh, and, just, and that is also a change, as you point out in the book, a change of tense. We go from the past tense. So in that respect, the first part of this last paragraph is more, feels like it's more of a continuation in some ways of those first two paragraphs. It's still focused on what happened. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and then we get to the more, the present tense, both read the same Bible. Okay, so the third paragraph begins. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or even before, the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Yeah. So I think the really remarkable thing here is the description of the slaves as belonging to the whole. Hmm. Right? One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves. Uh, so I, I think this is the beginning of um, racial reconciliation that he considers the slaves to be part of the whole. And in fact, they were part of the whole even while they were slaves. Right? Uh, so this is part of this uh, definition of the all. Okay? In the beginning, the all was the unionists. In the second paragraph, it expanded to include the insurgents. Now it expands to include the slaves. Uh, he tells us a number of things about this part of the population, their number. They were one-eighth. Uh, that's a substantial amount. Uh, he mentions their color. He mentions their condition, that they were enslaved. And he mentions their location. And look how he describes that location. Uh, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. So here, too, the South is part of the Union. The South is also part of the whole. 
right? Yeah. Uh, it's the southern part of the Union. I think there was a very dangerous tendency during the war for Northerners to believe that they were the Union. Uh, and Lincoln is cutting against that. Right. There is a southern part of the Union. Uh, he also, I, I think that description of not distributed generally over the Union, I think that's very revealing. He is indicating there that um, that the enslaved people were not were not free to live where they want to. They had been turned into commodities, and they were distributed. Uh, decisions were made by others uh, about where they lived. Uh, so I, I think that's a very uh, powerful understanding, actually, of um, you know the, the 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 wrong that slavery leads to. Yeah, uh, that human beings can just be distributed. Yeah. Um, and then the next uh, sentence, these slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. So note that he is not yet using the word slavery and he's not describing slavery as an institution. He describes it as an interest. Uh, so there are some people who, and it's a very powerful interest. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it's a cause of, uh, of, of faction. Right, this economic interest that some have in the commodification of others. Uh, and of course, he uses that word that's always been associated with slavery, peculiar. Uh, the, the Southerners following John C. Calhoun like to describe slavery as, you know, their peculiar institution. Uh, so I think he's chosen that word very, uh, very deliberately. Uh, yeah, and interest and, does seem to remind people that this was an economic interest it, it yeah. robs the Southern cause of the dignity of the, the noble cause, their peculiar institution, a whole fabric yeah. of life. There's none of that. This is a yeah. interest implies, don't you think, a kind of yeah, it's yeah, a raw and, gr and, and greedy yeah, yeah. Uh, economic. And he interest. uses that term what three times right there? Those two sentences. Uh, yeah, sentences. he keeps he keeps repeating it because he he doesn't want to say slavery. He's hmm. holding off on using the word slavery. When he finally uses the word slavery, it will have incredible force. Uh, when he speaks of American slavery and he capitalizes it. So he's, he's uh, uh, partly he's, he's doing this because he's, he has to find a locution that doesn't involve using the word slavery yet. He's, he's withholding that. Um, and then look at the interesting claim, all knew. <laughs> and all, what is it that all know? All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. So he has now specified the cause of the war. Uh, it was this economic interest in the commodification and property in man. Uh, and then we get the uh, description of the policy dispute. Uh, so this is a return to those parties. Right? What was it the government was trying to do and what was it that the insurgents were trying to do? To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. So uh, his account here is that the war arose from a policy dispute over the extension or the non-extension of slavery, of the slave interest. Um, again, he is um, he's saying nothing here about the abolitionists, right? those who wanted to bring about the immediate end of slavery. Uh, he says that this, this, the war emerged from a policy dispute. Yeah, and a dispute to ex uh, not just to preserve slavery, as the South kind of claimed, but to extend it. I mean, that, that was the more precise right. dispute, since Lincoln's position was, at the beginning of the war, was simply to restrict its right. extension, it's, not it, to abolish it. Not, they really, he was not an abolitionist. You know. Yeah, and, and as Lincoln understood it, the only way slavery, actually this is how the Southerners understood it too, the only way slavery could be made perpetual would be to allow it to extend, to press it to press it forward. Um, and then we get this, uh, this interesting sequence of five clauses, uh, all beginning with these uh, indefinite pronouns. Uh, showing certain similarities uh, between the sides. Right. Neither party expected uh, the war to be, you know, as, as devastating as it has been. Uh, neither anticipated that slavery would end, you know, that the cause of the war would end before the war itself ended. Um, you know, each expected an easier triumph, uh, a result less fundamental and astounding. Uh, so these all document the failures of foresight, I think. 
uh, what what human beings uh, didn't uh, didn't understand, uh, what they didn't expect or anticipate. Uh, it's also, I think, fascinating that uh, he speaks of this, uh, you know, each look for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Uh, he's basically saying that the abolition of slavery uh, is more fundamental and astounding than a Confederate victory would have been. Right? Uh, and here he is going beyond, I think, the Gettysburg Address. Uh, that's all about the maintenance of the of the nation and the description of, you know, the, the perishing of the government maybe being the perishing of the idea of self-government altogether. Right? Uh, and here he says that there's actually something more fundamental and uh, astounding than that. Uh, and that is this you know, unexpected uh, abolition of slavery as a result of the war. Yeah, that is interesting. So the, the, the quote, mere preservation of the Union is less, apparently would have been less fundamental and astounding, or the war itself would also be less uh, than, the, than the abolition of slavery. Yeah. The, the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself. I mean, he goes out of his way not to yeah. say the word quite yet, as you say, slavery. It's a very yeah. ad, odd kind of indirect way of... Of, of saying it, right? And yeah, when he says that the, the, ca the cause of the war would cease, I mean, he means the Emancipation Proclamation, right? right? Uh, which declared the, the freedom right. of the slaves, um, you know, completed by the 13th Amendment. But, um, and a result less fundamental and astounding. I suppose astounding lays the predicate for maybe the turn to, yes, to religion in a certain way, right? So it's something sort of, uh, beyond human understanding. Right. Something more mysterious and awe-inspiring. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then we get, um, you know, we, we, we do then get this final similarity, but that final similarity, I think, introduces this new, new element. Uh, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. So I think what he's showing there is that these similarities between the two sides culminate in the weaponization of religion. Right? That's what's being described there. Uh, they, they, they read the same Bible, they pray to the same God, and they use God. They instrumentalize God. Um, and I think that Lincoln will resist this by showing that there is a different way to do religion. He's not going to resist it by saying we need to separate religion and politics. He's going to resist the weaponization of religion by using religion to instill humility rather than using religion in this hypocritical or prideful way. But it is striking that the first introduction the introduction of, of the Bible and God uh, is, in a way, the lesson of that sentence just taken by itself is the fact that one reads the Bible or prays to the same God does not stop people from going to horrible war against each other. Right. I mean, so there's a kind of uh, lesson there about don't don't think because we're all, you know, uh, <laughs> reading the Bible, everything will be fine, right? So as you say, yeah. quite the opposite. It seems to maybe if you invoke his aid against the other, you're almost, as you say, weaponizing it, uh, making the conflict fiercer. Religion religion is introduced yeah. as a as an element of, uh, the, to, of making the conflict worse, not Right. Not of reconciliation at the beginning. Right. Uh, and again, this is very typical of Lincoln to take note of how Christianity appears in our politics and to criticize it and to try to substitute a different understanding of Christianity that won't lead uh, to this sort of fanaticism. Uh, you can see him doing it in the temperance address. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a lesson that he learned very early. Apparently, one of his favorite poems was from Robert Burns, uh, Holy Willie's Prayer. Uh, Holy Willie is this uh, hypocrite uh, who uses his prayers to uh, <laughs> try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 bring about bad things for his enemies. Uh, he wants to sick God on his enemies and meanwhile regarding himself as one of the elect. 
Uh, so it's a, a, a very uh, satirical poem uh, from Robert Burns. And I think you see Lincoln kind of taking that lesson and applying it in a very deep and tragic way in this, in this speech. And I do think then, as, as you'll now go through, I mean, that, yeah, he really seems to want to try to, yeah, introduce or revise the understanding of religion, Christianity, uh, among, in America, I think, it, maybe that's too ambitious a way, of, too grand a way of saying it, but I, I don't think it's wrong, actually, that, that the current situation, yeah. Christianity as it was practiced, I mean, I, in March, on March 4th, 1861, did not save us from war. Quite the contrary, it intensified the war. So he's now going to give a somewhat different account. I'm not 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 one that's not grounded in the sources, obviously, but yeah. uh, the, than the one that maybe prevailed at that point. Right, and that might also be why you know after this point, I mean, there's is, is incredible use of specific biblical passages from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Over the next few sentences, you get you get four. Uh, you know, uh, quotes or paraphrases directly from the Bible. Um, and, and, and the tense yeah. change, and, and also in that sentence that you read, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid. So suddenly we're not, yeah. we're, we're, we've moved from March 4th, 1861, where he explicitly was still, was still one sentence ago, each looked for an easier triumph. Yeah. And now we're in, now we're in, the present. I'm not sure. It's the, yeah, in a, the present, present, or maybe the perpetual present somehow. The, but right. I mean. uh, so long as Christianity remains, uh, this is a political problem. You could right, say. Right. Which. So this is really the yeah. Yeah. The political. Yeah. That, yeah. You could say that's the, You could say that's the statement of the theological political problem right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, isn't it? Okay. So we did come up with something new. I did not say that in the book. Okay. You know. This is why. <laughs> this is why you get you get the big box here conversations. Yeah. You know. The, <laughs> Great. Okay. That, yeah, I think okay. that's really a good truth, though. Okay. Yeah. So keep All right, going. So then, yeah. Let, let's just do uh, just the the little. We're still not yet at the Almighty. So so there's this really interesting moment here. He's just said that everybody you know is invoking God's aid against the other, and then he actually does it himself. He, he he's in a way illustrating the temptation, and he says, "Yeah, it may seem strange that any man should dare." to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. That's the, that's the appeal to an Old Testament passage. Uh, and uh, it's an expression of Lincoln's own feeling. He's indicating there, I believe God is anti-slavery. Uh, in some fundamental sense, I believe God is on my side. Um, how could those others have believed that, you know, they had theological warrant for what they were doing? Uh, and Lincoln had um, uh, writings on this, on pro-slavery theology. Uh, he was just savage uh, in his uh, taking apart of that pro-slavery theology. If God theology. were to be just, this would yeah. be true. I mean, true. Yeah. People so, want, want so to he, say God is just. <laughs> so he illustrates, in a way, the, the problem. And the problem is on his side. It's on the anti-slavery side this taking of the moral high ground. And then he pulls back from it. And he says, basing himself on the New Testament, let us judge not that we be not judged. So he, in a way, tries to illustrate the movement that has to be made by the anti-slavery side. Uh, in other words, one of the biggest problems after the war is going to be northern arrogance, northern vindictiveness, the uh, feeling that the South, uh, the treasonous South, uh, the slaveholding South should be held responsible for what the nation has gone through, for all of that death and destruction. And that feeling was incredibly strong in the North. And, and uh, it was clear how it was, it was going to play out in policy. Right? Thaddeus Stevens wanted to strip the, the, the seceded states of their, of their uh, state status, uh, reduce them to a territorial government, uh, do away with the existing boundaries and borders. And he says, let them eat the fruit of, the fruit of foul rebellion for a generation or two. Uh, so Lincoln here, I think, is administering a check to uh, particularly to his own side uh, in the war. And would you agree, as it struck me last night, that if you take this, that whole sentence, which has two parts, the, it, beyond, in a sense, the, I think you're absolutely right about the p more particular thing he's accomplishing, I mean, it's a deep reflection, in a way, on 
the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you want to put it this way, or on the two sides of a kind of, of religious belief. I mean, on the one hand, one has to believe uh, that uh, a just God would would support justice, and therefore <laughs> it seems strange to say. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wrong to say that you can it could you could justify slavery. But that's the old, let's call it that in a very simple way, the Old Testament view, the kind of just God. And then, but, but, and I think you pointed out in the Gettysburg Address how important but is, right, for Lincoln. But let us judge not that we be not judged, which is Matthew. And, and that's sort of the flip side. That's a kind of, I don't know what you call, well, I don't know what we'll call that, the uh, non-judgmental, yeah. let's be <laughs> literal, <laughs> side yeah. of, of a certain kind of religion, but the New Testament side, the Christian side, if you will. And somehow, each, I think, is insufficient. I guess that's what I would say, that it's yeah. not simply a movement. He doesn't simply prefer the let us judge not side of it because that's not possible in politics or correct even or right. Right. Quite, you know? Right. Anyway, so it's very striking to me that he has this, this that formulation with the Old Testament allusion. Neither of those is a quote in quotation marks, but they're both clearly a reference to Genesis 3 and then to Matthew 7. And then, but he, he sort of, poses the problem almost, I'd say, in that sense. Yeah, and I, I think he's, you're right that he's not saying, okay, the New Testament message trumps the Old Testament message. Right. He's not saying that. Uh, he's expressing both of them and he's holding them in a kind of balance. Right. Uh, he's not giving up on saying that, yeah, God is uh, uh, on the side of, uh, of anti-slavery. And in fact, he's going to make that more explicit. Yeah, and I think uh, he's going to he... go beyond, in a way, the, the, the dichotomy or try to show how one might resolve that as a political, yeah. religious matter. But. It, it might also just be pointing out here that he, he paraphrases from uh, from Matthew. Uh, right. And in, in Matthew, it's, it, you know, it's you, like, you know, don't judge so that ye be not judged. Hmm. And here he introduces us and we for the first time. And there again, I think it applies really to his own side, especially. Uh, that's who the us and the we are. It's those who are anti-slavery uh, who might be tempted to judge uh, judge the others harshly, to judge the slaveholders harshly. Um, so then he returns to the prayers. He's now sort of tamed his own uh, uh, moralism, and he returns to this matter of prayer, and he now does it more um, in a more distanced way, in a more logical way. What can we say when the prayers of two parties are at odds with one another? Well, the first thing we can say is the prayers of both could not be answered. God himself is bound by the principle of non-contradiction. <laughs> if the sides are opposed, you can't, uh, you can't satisfy the prayers of both sides. Uh, but then look what he says, that of neither has been answered fully. I think that's another moment at which he is eliding certain things. Uh, isn't it the case that the prayers of the North have been answered more fully? They are on the cusp of victory. Uh, but he doesn't want to highlight that. And so I think what he instead draws attention to is the, the common suffering um the you know that of that of neither has been answered fully he he, he doesn't again he, he's he's refusing to put god on the side uh of the of the north and of course it could, one could be answered more but not not fully maybe is you know if you wanted to try to find a balance between those two i, I took that slightly and this is i think it's not actually literally correct but that also he's suggesting something that Neither in the sentence before, which is not strictly speaking the prayers, it may seem strange that any man could, many men could ask a just God's assistance in bringing their bread, and then, but let us judge not that we be not judged. Maybe there's a little indication that neither of those sentences could quite be, neither of those wishes, I'm not sure they're quite prayers, uh, could be answered fully, that he's going to show that you somehow have to balance or transcend almost that opposition of, on the one hand, harsh judgment uh, on behalf of a just God, and on the other hand, non-judgmentalism, that neither, both are uh, of the, problematic interpretations, you might both say. Both of those but, attitudes, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so neither yeah. has been answered fully. Yeah. Here comes uh, the and then we get, sentences. yeah, and uh, this seems to, this sentence seems to come, um, 
as a result of these unanswered prayers, in other words, what is it that accounts for all of those years of unanswered prayers? It's that the Almighty has his own purposes. He's not just our instrument that we can wield. Uh, he has a will of his own. He has his own purposes. And that's a very striking, I was just struck in, in rereading it last night. I mean, that just, uh, and that is an assertion, a statement, unqualified, made in Lincoln's own name, in his own name. So many of the other sentences in this paragraph are, it may seem strange, um, we hope, you know, uh, if we shall suppose, if God wills, they're kind of conditional or suggestions, leaving some ambiguity about whether that is correct or not. But this is, is an, un I mean, he could have said, as has been said, or as many, you know, have noted, or, you know, one has to remember that the Almighty has his own, but he just asserts that. as, And that's a pretty striking assertion. I mean, it strikes me as being a little less obviously orthodox than one might think. I mean, it sounds like something, well, sure, the Bible says that all the time, though I don't know if it really does or not, but, but it's a very, if you think that through, what that implies, it's sort of... Uh, well, it's a, it, it can, I don't know, it can go in a lot of different directions. It's a very striking sentence statement for him to make in his own yeah, name. Yeah, and we, and we might think about what the alternative account would be, and he actually gives it in that letter to Thurlow Weed, the letter that I mentioned before. Let me just read this. Uh, he explains why people didn't like this speech, what they took offense at. He says, men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. So you either have this divine possibility where the Almighty has his own purposes and he was working in the world uh, throughout the Civil War, or there's an atheistic possibility. There is no God. Uh, and he says, it's a truth which I thought needed to be told. And I thought others the... could afford for me to tell it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> but in the category of leaving aside the atheistic possibility, that it could be that the Almighty has his own purposes, which we do not know, or which are inaccessible to us. Or it could be, and I think the Bible has both in some different times, actually. Or it can be the Almighty has his own purposes, which we can sort of divine uh, as long as we're careful, as long as we're careful not to just ascribe to him our purposes. But those are both left open at this point, I think. Right. But I, I mean, he will, I think, indicate that the Almighty has his own purposes. So the initial suggestion is, we had our purposes and they weren't in accord with the Almighty's. Um, but the Almighty's purposes are somewhat mysterious, but the next few sentences, I think, move in the direction of saying the long duration of the war and what happened, uh, the, the, the fact that the slaves were freed, all of that leads us now in hindsight to be able to discern uh, what those purposes were. Yeah, or you could say, you know, he, he also gives a formulation of that in the very last paragraph, you know, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see right. the right. Th that doesn't mean uh, God gives us perfect vision, right? right. He, it seems to be an indication that our knowledge, it never fully accords with uh, God's knowledge. We somehow have to believe both that there are these purposes, that we can sort of discern them, but we can't be overconfident about that because right. then we would fall into the first trap of just, as you said, weaponizing uh, sort of the Bible or religion on one side, right? So it's an yeah. interesting, it's a tough balance, you might say, yeah. Okay, so the Almighty has his own purposes, that's asserted, and then we get a, a quotation, right? Direct quotation, yes verbatim woe unto uh -huh. the world because of offenses for it must needs be that offenses come but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh yeah. so this is human sinfulness yeah uh, but i mean it does raise all these deep questions that many theologians have spent volumes <laughs> discussing which is it's a i mean it's both a clarification but also a paradox on the one hand these offenses have to come so you can't i mean how can you blame us if god wants them to come what are we supposed to do about it so it's a kind of you know predestination sort of thing and all this and then but woe to the man yeah. nonetheless i mean i think it raises the whole paradox of holding people accountable for their actions when there's an omnipotent, omnipotent and omniscient god yeah i guess i read that a little differently it must needs be that offenses come 
I guess I see this as this is part of the providence of God because God's creation involves the creation of a being with free will. Yeah, uh, but that means there will be human right. sinfulness. So, well, that's anyway, reconcile. that's my way of sol solving it. Uh, probably, probably. <laughs> maybe, yeah, that's fair maybe, enough. Maybe, that's, maybe that's too good. easily, but, um, and then uh, we get the longest uh, sentence uh, of the speech. Uh, if we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? That is an incredibly complex uh, sentence. <laughs> um, it, it, I think, is the sentence in which he offers the theological interpretation of the meaning of the Civil War. And to put it more simply, uh, the war is explained as the blood price for the national sin of slavery. And you know, we can note a number of things about this. Note that he says American slavery. So he now uses slavery for the first time. Uh, and it's American slavery. It's not Southern slavery. It's not African slavery. It's American slavery. The whole nation shares in this. Uh, the war is given to both sides. Uh, and so the woe due to those by whom the offense came, the offense was a national transgression. Um, and then, um, you know, this is an if, right? If we shall suppose, this is a supposition, this is a hypothetical. He doesn't say he knows this to be true. Uh, I think, I mean, you're right that he, he was very assertive in saying the Almighty has his own purposes, but he's not assertive here. And I think part of the reason is that really would cross a kind of bright line uh, between uh, politics and religion. Uh, so he offers this as a as a supposition, and then that supposition leads to a question. Right. <laughs> if if this is true, if this is what God is up to, uh, would this in any way depart from our understanding of the nature of God, uh, a just God, uh, an all powerful God, uh, an, an all knowing God, God, a living God, a living which God, is, which he capitalizes as you point yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, it's not capitalized actually in the King James Bible, uh, the word living. So he, a, and he's very familiar with the phrase, it's used repeatedly in the King James, uh, but he capitalizes it. So you have American slavery and a living God. Yeah, this longest sentence is a question. I mean, that is interesting, right? And the, so the, the kind of the very heart of it is, of, you could argue, the second and arguable isn't a statement, it's a question, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a question that I think he uh, assumes or believes most Americans will answer in the affirmative. In right, other so words, this, invites, this does accord. He, he invites yeah. us to say, yeah, right, uh, right. God, God would uh, punish uh, all of us for this. Right. I mean, I think he literally or strictly, one could answer it the other way. I mean, he doesn't rule that out exactly, but... Um, the answer to the shall we discern any departure uh, which from the those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribed to him could be answered, I suppose, that we yes, we do see some departure, but and in fact, some people on both sides would say, yes, it's a departure. I mean that you know God certainly couldn't have intended all this horrible bloodshed. I mean, you make this point in the book, and people who die who are totally innocent of slavery, you know, of slavery, of, of slavery, people who are children and great-grandchildren of the people who brought the enslaved over and so forth. So right. it's not well, as Why it's, does this generation bear, you know, the, right. the full responsibility for American slavery? And why do all of these non-slaveholders, uh, all of those fighting on the Union side are non-slaveholders? Most of those fighting on the Southern side are non-slaveholders. Right. They're poor whites. Uh so one, I suppose, could challenge uh, the just the justice of, of what is being the, done. I mean, he leaves it as a question. But as you say, the question invites the, of course, the positive answer. And then there's the fam the believers in a living God, which does, you know, who knows what his own belief was, but it certainly distances him 
as if we shall suppose that yeah. presumably includes Lincoln, and that he doesn't say here, you know, from which we believers in the living God always ascribe to him. Right. Have, you know. he, he doesn't necessarily include himself in that category of the believers right. in a living Leaves God. Leaves just ambiguous, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're well, not ambiguous. She just doesn't say one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. That's it really is amazing. Um, uh, but I, I, I do think he's very serious that the nation needs to embrace this interpretation of the war as a kind of um, precondition for forward movement, both on the sectional, the problems of the sectional divide, and the problem of the racial divide. So yeah, I, that's, I, so that's the predicate in a way for reconstruct for a sound reconstruction. Yeah. In that respect, the speech is, has to come before. And it is the material that is offered for Lincoln to work with by the nature of the people that he's dealing with. Right. It also suggests what would be maybe in Lincoln's view a healthier or politically healthier, maybe truer also view of the Bible or of religion or of God. You know, this kind of not, neither the militarizing of it on the one side, so to speak, or the who's to judge on the other, but this much more yeah. complex. I, yeah, actually here what's happening is we need to recognize ourselves as being judged, mm -hmm. right? Well, we're not gonna judge, we're gonna recognize that we have been judged yeah, right? as, a, as a nation. Um, and then you get uh, this, uh, a kind of digression, I, I think, uh, and this is a rhyming sentence. I've never really liked this sentence. I right. find the rhyme irritating. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. It's it's sort of how do people react if if they perceive that this is what God is doing? Well, <laughs> we pray for it to end. <laughs> Right. So he is here back with kind of the, the human perspective on this. Uh, we, we just want the war to end. But, uh, but I do believe that this represents a step forward. If you look at what's been done with prayer in this speech, uh, earlier the prayers were prayers against the, the other side, right? Praying for their defeat, praying against other human beings. Uh, but now uh, people are conjoined in just praying for the punishment to end. If the war is understood as punishment, we, we, we plead for an end to that. So there's a kind of convergence now on a longing for divine mercy. Right, it seems like a nice expression of a, of a, of a hopefulness or prayer, uh, on a, from very much from a human point of view, as you say, that God's not in that sentence. Um, uh, but then it's corrected, I feel like. I mean, it's uh, the yeah. last two sentences, which are often just taken as kind of flowing from each other. The final sentence of this paragraph um, cuts against that preceding sentence, right? Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, so you've got this kind of easy rhyme, uh, you know, oh, if only it would end. And then he insists, no, how about this? You know, it, it, it's not up to us. We've seen the fate of our prayers before. Uh, this is dependent on God's will. And if God wills that it continue... If God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether." So uh, this, I think, is a vision of eye for eye divine reparations. Right? The war is a scourge, and that scourge might continue uh, until it equals what was extracted by the literal scourge of the lash. Right? How much treasure must be sunk? How much blood must be shed? And the way he determines to answer that. It's a kind of accounting problem, right? The, the way he answers it is to go back 250 years to the origin date of American slavery. If you do the math, there is always math involved in, in, in every Lincoln speech, right? Four score and seven years ago, you do the math there, you get to 1776, you do the math here, and you get to 1619, 
or thereabouts. You get to 1615, right? So it's 1865 minus 250 years uh, is 1615. Uh, 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 Lincoln had read um, uh, early American historians uh, who talked about the significance of this date. Uh, William Grimshaw put it between the years of 1616 and 1619. Uh, so here Lincoln is saying that there is a whole century and a half of enslavement before the revolution, before the Constitution, and all of that colonial debt, that too is part of American slavery. Um, you know, we've uh, spent a lot of time lately thinking about this date, 1619. We had the quadricentennial uh, of 1619 in, in uh, 2019, and we also had the New York Times uh, 1619 project. Uh, the argument that I make in the book is that Lincoln's second inaugural is the original and better 1619 project. Uh, the uh, I think motivating uh, premise of the 1619 project uh, is that America is irredeemably racist, structurally racist, uh, 1776, 1787, 1865, all of those dates are just a, uh, an extension of that original 1619 uh, 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 sin Right, uh, into the uh, into the American future, the folks at the 1619 Project understand even the Thirteenth Amendment in this way. Right, the uh, Thirteenth Amendment was not uh, freedom for the slaves; it was the origins of the carceral state, right? because an objection, because an exception was made that you know people could be uh, uh, sentenced to labor, uh, you know, if if criminally convicted. So. Uh, the reason I think that Lincoln's 1619 project is better uh, is because he understands the significance of this date, he understands the wrong of American slavery, but he believes that 1776 was the antithesis of 1619, right? There you'd go back to the Gettysburg Address to see how he understands what was accomplished uh, in 1776, the nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to equality. Uh, the Constitution in 1787 had certain pragmatic compromises, but it was anti-slavery in principle. Uh, Lincoln is very sincere, I think, in arguing that the Constitution is anti-slavery in principle. Uh, and so Lincoln is trying to help us understand the relationship between these significant American dates. Uh, what's going on is a uh, kind of contest uh, between slavery and freedom. And this is a contest that has been present uh, throughout American history and has now uh, achieved a, a new denouement uh, with, the, with the end uh, of American slavery through, and, and, and here in this speech, he says this is owing to God. Yeah, and so in that, it is kind of a 60, his 1619 project. It's a bit of a correction, I would say, to the maybe to Gettys to the impression one might have from Gettysburg that you know 1776 blank slate uh, liberty and uh, you know conceived yeah. liberty and so forth and right and uh, now we have a new birth of freedom and you know and this is a little bit complicates the the narrative the the story. Um, yeah, that's right. In other words, there is a much longer lasting legacy. Uh, that has to be confronted. Uh, and of course, he's aware of this already in the speeches from the 1850s when he talks about, you know, why, why didn't the founders just do away with slavery? Well, that's because there was already this pre-existing institution. Uh, so that's not actually a new thought, but I think at this moment of reconstruction, you know, he is freshly aware of the dilemmas of the future. Uh, you've now addressed slavery to an extent uh, by abolishing American slavery, but you haven't yet addressed the, the racial problem. And I do believe that this interpretation that he offers of the war is, is uh, that it's addressed to the various audiences out there. It's addressed to Northerners and their temptation, which will be towards uh, arrogance and vindictiveness towards the South. Uh, it's addressed to the Southern problem, which is going to be Southern resentment, uh, sectional resentment, uh, lost cause romanticism, and also uh, backlash against blacks and resistance to any further steps 
towards the civic incorporation of the black population. And I believe it is uh, addressed to um, the new black citizens as well. There's a danger there also. There is a danger of um, rage, uh, justified rage at the injustice of the past and the continuing injustice in the present. Uh, and a, uh, a danger of, um, of um, retaliation or alienation on their part. So I, I think that this interpretation gives something, um, promises something to each of those audiences and provides a foundation on which human charity can become possible. So you can't get to that final paragraph with malice toward none, with charity for all, uh, without this kind of ground clearing interpretation of the meaning of the war. But the ground clearing, I would say, I, mean, I think that's really excellent, but it's also, it's a construction of a new sort of edifice for understanding it, as you as you show. And it's a complicated, I mean, I would just say that the task he's put before himself and his successors is a complicated one. On the one hand, we have to accept that this perhaps was God's will. On the other hand, we can't be too much interested in retribution. I mean, we can't just move on and pretend nothing right. happened and no problem here either. And in that respect, he's somewhat sympathetic to some of the 1619 Project kind of uh, implications, you might say. So it's a, yeah. he's asking for a kind of public uh, civil religion or religious religion, I guess, that is a pretty complicated uh, uh, task for a citizen reader to take forward. I mean, it, and of course, we've shown how complicated it is in the century and a half since, I suppose, you know. Yeah, he's not he's not tidying, tidying this up. He's not saying, you know, OK, now all done. Uh, you know, we've recognized our national transgression. We've apologized and we can move on. Uh, what he does say is let us strive on. There will be uh, human striving in the future. But as the foundation for that striving, we have to have some sort of common understanding about what this was all about. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and and I, I, I guess I want to st stress this point of, about divine reparations um, as, in a way, something that he is offering for blacks. And I think it was why he was so interested in Frederick Douglass's reaction to this speech. Uh, at the reception afterwards, uh, Douglass uh, was there. Uh, there's an interesting backstory there about how difficult it was for him to gain entrance, but he does eventually gain entrance. To the White House. And to the White House, uh, at the reception afterwards. Uh, he was also at the speech itself. Um, and uh, Lincoln greets him by saying, you're the man I want to see. I, I want to know what you thought of it. Uh, your opinion is, is the one that matters most to me. And, and uh, Douglas says, uh, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. And in every speech afterwards that Douglas gave where he mentions Lincoln, he quotes that sentence, that divine reparation sentence. Every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be repaid by another drawn with the sword. Uh, so I, I think Douglas understood what was what was being offered there. Um, he often described black freedom as blood bought freedom, and there is a, a, a statement there that God was on the side of the slave all along. Uh, it took him a long time to vindicate the slaves. And so there's a sort of lesson about patience. Uh, there's a lesson about gratitude for freedom when it comes. And I think there is a kind of lesson ab about mercy. So in, in one sense, the picture is a pretty horrific one, right? Every drop of blood drawn with the lash has to be repaid with another drawn with the sword. God might do that. God would be just if he did that. And yet, the war is almost over. God is actually not going to exact that eye for an eye justice. God is merciful. And it's in a kind of recognition of that that I think Lincoln hopes that human beings will imitate that mercy, that they will find it in their hearts to be merciful also. And that is a message to everyone, 
but it's also, I think, a particular message to blacks, and that is making a very high civic demand on them. Yeah, and 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 in terms of the religious teaching, as it were, he's sort of corrected, but he's taken the Almighty has His own purposes, and now says, quotes the Psalm, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So he has his own purposes in timing, you might say, and in how much yeah. uh, pain he's going to put everyone through. But one has to ultimately, uh, he's, it still must be said, at least it must be said, yeah. you know, who knows what he thinks, but it must be said that the judgments, for, for the sake of a healthy civic religion, I would almost put it this way, or a healthy, as I say, religious religion, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He does want to end with that. You know, after all that calling into question whether we yeah. can know and, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, look at what's happened to blame, right? The problem is that everybody's going to be blaming each other. Right. right? Uh, Northerners are going to blame Southerners. Southerners are going to blame blacks. Uh, there's going to be all of this blame. And Lincoln is trying to clear that away. And he's saying we're going to share the blame. We're all going to admit it. We're going to acknowledge it. And then in a certain sense, we can blame God. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also, because yeah. he's the one doing it. But but then in the end, we can't blame him either, right? because what he's doing is just and righteous. So he's 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 trying to take take blame away. He's trying to dissipate that blame and open up the space for mercy and charity. OK, which leads us to the last paragraph. You said you, you, you sort of would always slightly dislike the you know little finally do we hope for only do we pray. Yeah. I've always slightly balked at the last paragraph in the sense that it seems like oh. such a come down. I know you like it. Such yeah, a come like down it. from the depth and complexity and biblical quotations of, of the preceding sentences. And then it's a fairly yeah. straightforward, I mean, eloquent, obviously. Uh, you know, we've got to fix things here and let's hope we're all at peace with one another. It's sort of like, really, yeah, I don't Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you, you, you read, actually... it and then def- read it and then defend it. <laughs> all right. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Uh, So... The imperative is let us strive on. That's actually the sentence, let us strive on. And there are three clauses before it, uh, which I think describes the spirit in which one has to strive. And then there are four clauses after it, which describe what actually has to be done. So the three before, I think the order here is interesting with malice towards none. In other words, the, the exclusion of malice comes first. And that would actually be significant in itself, yeah. <laughs> even if you didn't get charity, if you just got no malice. And uh, I did, I've done a little search on this word malice. It is interesting how often Lincoln uses the phrase with reference to race relations and particularly mm. white, white hostility towards blacks. So uh, I, I think that, again, he is, he's, he's thinking about the, the, the racial problem there, the, the sectional problem as well, but, but, but very much the racial problem. Uh, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Of course, there, you, you know, he's using one of the Christian virtues. Uh, you'd have to think about what he's doing there. We saw him in the Lyceum Address uh, calling for reverence, uh, using a religious concept in, with a political application. Is he doing the same thing here? Is it a kind of political appropriation of religious language, or is he actually calling for, you know, the Christian virtue of charity? I, I think that's a real, a real question. Uh, and then the, the one that I, I think not enough attention is paid to, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. So there he's indicating, when he earlier said, let us judge not, you know, that we be not judged, uh, he, he, he's not taking away human judgment altogether, right? We have to act with firmness in the right as God gives us to see it. We have to use our human judgment. We have to use human prudence. Um, but it always has to be held in this balance. We always have to be aware that our judgment is not perfect, our vision is not perfect. Uh, there has to be a kind of humility in the exercise. There has to be both firmness and humility uh, in the exercise of human judgment. 
Okay. That's uh, good. So we strive to finish the work we are yes. in. Yes. Yeah. I take it that the work we are in actually means the war. Yeah. The war is not over yet. Right. Uh, and he, there he's echoing the language of the, the Gettysburg Address again. Um, so we've got to win, right? Uh, charity is the work of the victor, even though he's downplaying victory here. Uh, you know, right. We do still have to win the war. Let us finish the work we are in. And then you turn to the, you know, the, the uh, reconciliation, the, uh, the truth and, and, and justice reconciliation project. Uh, to bind up the nation's wounds. Uh, here again, he's echoing language that he's used before. Think back to the Lyceum Address, the very end of the Lyceum Address. He spoke about the wounds, uh, the wounds of the revolutionary generation, that generation that was passing from the scene. And there, the wounds had a salutary effect because they reminded of the revolution and that fight for liberty and equality. But now, these wounds have to be healed. They have to be bound up. These wounds are emblematic of, of civil strife, of civil war. Right? So the wounds are not just the literal wounds, although it does include that. I mean, think of all of those amputees uh, after the war. Uh, but it, but it's metaphorical wounds. It's, uh, it's spiritual wounds. Oh, the nation's wounds. But then he the gets nation's to the, he gets to yeah. the amputees in the next right. uh, next clause, really. You know? yeah. yeah. So, so, so the nation has been damaged by this civil war. That has to be bound up. Uh, and then it, this care, right? So you've got charity, you've got care, mm. you've got cherishing, uh, all of these words that are kind of of a of a piece to care for him who shall have borne the battle. It's the veterans and for his widow and his orphan. Again, a kind of echo of biblical language about widows and orphans. Uh, the widows and the orphans are emblematic of human vulnerability altogether. Right? And his focus is there. Uh, and again, I, I just want to add what, what we know about what Lincoln has uh, done right around this time. He has extended uh, widows' benefits to the common law marriages that slaves had. Hmm. Um, those slaves, uh, th those marriages were not legally recognized. And when, this, when Lincoln became aware of that injustice, uh, that these black women were not eligible for war, war benefits, uh, he stepped in and had that uh, rectified uh, legislatively. Uh, so that those women would be cared for. So this care here, uh, again, is all in all inclusive, uh, blacks and whites. Uh, care for his widow and his orphan, and then to do all which may achieve and cherish. That's such an interesting word. You don't usually think of, I don't know, do you, to, 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 to cherish peace, right. Right? To not just to achieve it or maintain it, but to cherish it, to cherish a just and a lasting peace, a particular kind of peace. Uh, a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So here you see him bringing the use of the word all to its sort of full fruition. First paragraph, it was just the unionists. Second paragraph, it expanded to include the the insurgents. Uh, third paragraph, it expands to include the slaves and all of their uh, stolen labor. And then in the final paragraph, it's charity for all, doing all, and then all nations, that global expansion at the end, which you saw also in the Gettysburg Address, you know, so the government of by and for the people shall not perish from the earth. But I think, don't you think a little bit of, I was struck also by the contrast with Gettysburg, which has such a high, you know, this is the new birth of freedom, and this is the test of whether a nation so constituted, <coughs> excuse me, can, can survive. And then, as you say, at the end, uh, government of, well, not at the end, but government of by and for the people, whereas here, there's a kind of attempt, I think, having gone to the heights of the religious question, to remind us that, look, in the human sphere, peace is really, you know, it's it's not the, he, he could have said, you know, defend freedom or, you know, something, new birth, he yeah. could have had new birth of freedom in there, and he doesn't, I think, quite conspicuously. It's more, I mean, it's implied, I'd say, in that third yeah. paragraph, but it's it's a somewhat... Uh, prosaic almost ending, you might say, you know. Well, I guess I would say transcendent, but... <laughs> okay. Well, just um, in lasting peace. I yeah, guess it's not I mean, just I, I do think yeah. it's important that, yeah, that it's not it's not peace at any cost. Yes, I agree, um, right. It's, it's a just peace and a lasting one, and maybe only a just peace can be a lasting one. Right, and maybe peace implies a little more than just non-conflict i think you know that's true in the jewish tradition certainly shalom you know it's a it's a it's a higher concept yeah. than merely literal you know let's not go to war in the near future so uh, um, and in fact he's already raised the possibility that we i mean 
uh, you know, he's but he said the wars happen, right? Wars wars can't come, and they maybe and they the will again. Came. I mean, you know, so it's a. Uh, but I mean, I think it's e- it's pretty easy to see the not easy. I mean, the the, the more practical political uh, American post eighteen sixty five agenda of that last paragraph, and that's how people take it correctly. I think it is. It's a, it, trying to think about it in context of the preceding paragraph is a little. I've always found it just a little uh, hard to figure out in a sense, but um, uh, I guess just again with the binding of the wounds, yeah. which also has vague Christian right uh, imagery. But on the other hand, it's also a fairly—I mean—it's extremely humanitarian and 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 good thing to do. I'm not being—I don't want to sound, but it's not. It's a more c- uh, civil care of our fellow citizens. It's not, you know, again, a call to greatness, if you want, you know? That's what I guess, what's always struck me about the end of the second inaugural, you know? You think it's kind of great. You, you want to say it's kind of greatness. I, that, that's fair enough, probably. Yeah, I mean, to actually bind up the nation's wounds. Yes, I guess um, that's fair. To, to put the nation on a new footing and a new foundation. And, and I think he has hinted at what this is going to involve, right? One eighth of the whole population. Uh, you have four million new freedmen and they are going to need, to, what will their place be right. in, the, in the American polity? That, that is the big question ahead. Yeah. And, and so I, I think he doesn't want to just say that baldly because he has to get people in the proper spirit to confront those dilemmas ahead. No, I think that's a very important point and a good way of correcting my uh, my point, which is that, I mean, it is striking that he doesn't say in a way what you said a minute ago, what he doesn't say, we now have a chance, yeah. I mean, this would be a normal politician, right? we now have a chance to go to a more glorious future, better than we've had, because we could, we've gotten rid of the evil of slavery, and, and now we can have a truly more just order, and we can do this, and we can do that, right? I and mean, there's none of that, really. It's a much more muted or modest, you might say, but yeah. maybe that's what you need to do this first. The binding up of the wounds has to precede the construction of a better, you know, order. Yeah, and and we do get an indication in that final speech of what he has in mind, uh, particularly with respect to blacks, where he moves moves in the direction of embracing black suffrage, uh, and also education on a uh, non-segregated basis. Uh, He praises the Louisiana Constitution for moving in that direction. Uh, But to do that would already set off all of these alarm bells, right, on the part of, you know, those who are not not on board with that. So uh, I, I do see this as preparation, uh, but, it, but it's kind of spiritual preparation. Right. And slightly anti-utopian in the sense of it's yeah. not, you know, Woodrow Will, the world's okay, the war's over, let's have a world safe for democracy. You know, it's, I mean, he, he could have said a version of that. He sort of right. does at Gettysburg, you might almost say. But um, he doesn't. I mean, he, he's more muted or more modest in what he thinks, in the near term at least, we, our goals should be. And again, this is part of the problem of addressing Northerners who are already, you know, many steps further down the down the line uh, on the sort of progressive agenda. Right. And, and so he is he's he's tamping down that triumphalism. And he uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. He is also kind of tamping down or saying we need to move. Uh, move more slowly. And maybe ultimately always in politics, a little bit of tamping down. The speech does tamp down triumphalism in a broader sense, right? I mean, it's a very, yeah. Yeah, kind of amazing. You're about to win a war and and be vindicated and you give a speech yeah. that really cuts, you might almost say, in the opposite direction from a normal, what a normal speech would be at that time, right? Yeah. Well, this has been yeah, great. Final thoughts? He's, um, well, he's a statesman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I say a word about the, Gettysburg the, and this together. So I am sort of struck by that. You, you see more well, continuity, and I see a little more yeah, I, contrast or correction. But I suppose both. Of course, I, are true. I wouldn't call it cor- correction. I mean, I they these are given at specific moments, and as a statesman, he o- is always addressing that particular moment, the the occasion. Um. Yeah, so I, I I don't I don't see this great great difference yeah um but they need to be read together obviously i mean i mean i guess lincoln knew gettysburg was going to be the one that everyone would memorize 
and that this would take a while. As you said, it wasn't immediately as popular and it's harder to memorize and it would be important, important in its teaching and in its tone and, in its, and for those who took it seriously, like Frederick Douglass, but somewhat different audience. I, I wonder if, if he will ultimately be right that this is the one that lasts the longest. I, I think it becomes harder to appreciate the further re- removed we get from kind of public Christianity. Uh, so that there would be many who might think this speech crosses some kind of line, you know, between between politics and, and religion. Um, and that's not true of Gettysburg. I mean, there's the one phrase under God, but otherwise, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think it is, uh, I think, and also, Gettysburg is a kind of universal speech. People all around the world can read and appreciate. They can somehow see their own nation in that uh, in that presentation almost, you know, or, or their own struggles, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, whereas this one is so specific. You know, this is American slavery. And the Bible and Christianity as opposed to other yeah. religions. On the other hand, it does, in a way, hint at the deepest political, theolo- theological, political questions in a way that maybe Gettysburg elides a little bit, I would say. You know, it's, Gettysburg is more on a political plane, very high yeah. political plane. And this goes beyond politics. I mean, yeah, that's really a, a, it, it does, but, but I guess I would insist still on its political purpose. Oh, t- totally. In other words, yeah, 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 the theological interpretation is offered for a political reason. And, and, you know, he's certainly quoting from the Bible, including the New Testament, but I do think, you know, a statement like the Almighty has his own purposes. Uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims can all. Right. Yeah, yeah this theology, I think, is kind of compatible uh, with, all, with all three revealed Maybe religions. Even with non-monotheistic religions, but that would be another another story but anyway um well this has been great uh, diana and um thank you for taking the time and uh i really have learned a lot and we'll have to come back to this or maybe other of course if lincoln was capable of doing this in this speech (laughs) and in gettysburg there are other speeches oh the speech is from the 1850s yeah that are less famous because he wasn't yet president or it's not quite at the same level of just uh, ability to shape the nation but of course he he was capable of, of of conveying very deep uh, thoughts about politics and democracy and, and so forth uh, in the yeah. on that and I think I've heard you also discuss the speech on inventions I think it's called and discoveries. Oh yeah, the lecture on discoveries and so inventions. We, can, we have plenty more conversations we can have on Good. Lincoln and on <laughs> and on others as well. So Diana, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on conversations.